this is Philip Blackwell, pastor of the Bible Baptist Church in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And we're glad that you've tuned in today to one of our Bible messages. The sermon that you're about to hear was preached behind the pulpit of our church at one of our regularly scheduled services. We pray that the Lord speaks to your heart as you listen. for our sheep of the week. Uh, that's Brother James and Miss Gail Ray. Uh, so let's please remember to pray for them that the Lord would uh, touch them and help them and uh, just pray for their physical well-being and their spiritual well-being uh, that the Lord would bless them and help them during this time. Also, please remember to pray for our missionary family of the week. It's the Sanabria family. They are our missionaries to Columbia, South America. And uh, we ask you to remember to pray for them. I know they are serving in uncertain times, even where they're at, and uh, so they would appreciate your prayer, so please do uh, remember that. Something I want to uh, uh, just reiterate this evening is that we are uh, going to start in-person services beginning this Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Now, our service times are going to be our normal service times. Uh, Sunday morning will be 1030. Our evening service will be 6 o'clock. And on Wednesday nights, we will be meeting at 7 o'clock. Uh, we will not be having Sunday school right now. We're going to wait on that. Uh, we're going to slowly open. I've talked to several pastors, and uh, they're doing the same thing that we're planning on doing. And uh, so you pray that the Lord would uh, just bless and we'd be able to open up fully here soon. Uh, but what a blessing it's going to be to be able to get back uh, in the church house. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to take several precautions to keep you safe, and uh, we'll explain that to you beginning on Wednesday night. And uh, so one thing that we will ask you to do when you come in on Wednesday night or Sunday is that we ask you to sit with your family. All right, so every family sit together, please. Uh, if you have small ones running around, uh, uh, you want to keep them with you. Uh, if you need to take them to the nursery, the nursery will be open. Uh, but we will not have any nursery workers back there. Uh, but you can go back there with your little one, and uh, you can watch the service on the TV that's provided back there for you. Uh, we have a camera set up in the sanctuary now, and uh, what goes on in the sanctuary, you'll be able to see it and hear it uh, in the nursery. And so you can go in there uh, with your little ones, all right? So if you would like to do that, that'd be perfectly fine. Uh, but we will not have a church nursery uh, where we have our church nursery workers back there. Uh, we're just trying to keep everybody safe right now, and I know you'll understand as we do that. So please note that if you will. Also, uh, whenever we come on Wednesday night, you'll sit with your families. And uh, I will ask uh, that you be mindful of people's personal space. Not everybody that's going to come is going to be comfortable with uh, handshaking and uh, you being in their faces. I know some, some folks, we don't understand personal space. And so I just want to encourage you to uh, be mindful of other people. You may not have a fear in your heart about anything that's going on. And you may not be, you mind getting close to someone, uh, but just be mindful. If you see someone nervous, if you get too close, and you see someone a little nervous, they start stepping back. Or if they're wearing a mask, uh, just be mindful of their personal space and their comfort because we want everybody to be comfortable as we uh, begin to have our services again. Also, if you would, we would ask as well, uh, the way we're going to receive the offering is going to be a little bit different. We're not going to be passing the plate uh, from person to person. We're going to have one offering plate on the uh, communion table in the front, the offering table in the front. We're going to have another offering table uh, in the back of the sanctuary. And uh, you can either drop it in before the service, you're offering in before the service or after the service. It really doesn't matter. We'll make sure that we have some folks that keep their eye on those plates to make sure uh, nothing happens to those. But uh, that's how we're going to receive the offering for the next few weeks. Uh, but you be in prayer that God give us wisdom as we uh, begin to open back up. I know that in every church you have a couple of different philosophies. You have the folks that think we never should have closed down. And you've got the folks that think that uh, we shouldn't open up right now. I know everybody's got different feelings about things. Nobody has communicated to me about any of that. Uh, but I would say this. Be gracious in what we're trying to do. 
And uh, be mindful. The Lord's been good to us during this time. And so as we open back up and get things going back to full swing, uh, in full swing again, I just ask for your patience and your grace as we do that. We're looking forward to what God's going to do. I really believe that uh, the remainder of the year is going to be a great uh, part of our uh, the year for us. I believe the Lord's really going to bless. And uh, so we're looking forward to what's going to happen uh, the remainder of this year. But you be in prayer as we begin to open things back up. I will tell you this, that we really didn't close for one service. Uh, we had the doors open at every service. Sometimes it was just me and Brother Tom here, and uh, me, Brother Tom, and Brother Adrian here. But we always had the doors open. If somebody would have came in and uh, needing the Lord, we would have let them come in. We wouldn't have stopped them from coming in. If somebody would have showed up and they wanted to just sit in the service. We never would have stopped them from coming. So the services went on. Uh, we still had preaching, everything. We really didn't close the doors one service uh, while we were doing this. But I will tell you this, that we can trust the Lord. As we open back up, let's have faith and confidence in the Lord and in what God is going to do. So let me just say it one more time. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Sunday morning, 1030. And also uh, we have the evening service at 6 o'clock. So that will be our service times. Uh, for the next week. So please do uh, remember those if you will. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and uh, we'll ask the Lord to bless uh, Brother Absher as he comes to preach to us the Word of God. So let's pray tonight. Lord, we are grateful for your goodness and mercy and Lord, even in times like this, we're thankful for the growth and the grace that you've shown our church. Lord, we're not worthy of the mercy that you have shown. We're not worthy of your grace that's been bestowed Lord, we're not worthy of the favor that you've given to this place. And Lord, we're just so thankful for all that you've done, Lord, over these past two months. Lord, I know it's been different. I know for many it's been very difficult. But Lord, I'm thankful that you're still, uh, still good to your people. And Lord, you're still taking care of your people. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue to uh, bless the families of Bible Baptist Church. Bless our friends as well, Lord, that are not necessarily members, but they attend this church. God, I pray you'd bless them as well. Lord, we're so grateful that we get to serve you in these days. There are many that are looking at the times, and they're very fearful. But, Lord, these times that we're living in are very exciting times. Lord, these are times which the child of God ought to be excited because I believe that your coming is closer than it's ever been. And I believe we just need to look up with encouragement because our redemption draweth nigh. Lord, all these things that are coming to pass, I believe, is according to your plan. Lord, I believe that this situation didn't uh, surprise you. Lord, you knew what was going to happen. And Lord, you've shown us how easily the Antichrist is going to be able to take over this world when he comes in peace. And so, Lord, I just pray for your children. I pray for your people this evening that you would bless them, encourage them, and help them during this time. And God, I pray you'd help them to be confident in you and confident in your grace. Lord, you've never let us down before. God, and I don't believe you'll let us down now. God, you've always taken care of us. And Lord, you've always taken care of your churches. And Lord, we know that you'll continue to do so. So Lord, give us courage. Give us strength. God, give us a spirit of grace as well as we move forward in your will. Now, Lord, we are thankful for the Sanabria family there in uh, Colombia. Lord, we pray that you would meet their needs. God, I pray that they would understand that there is a church family here in Tuscaloosa that loves them and that offers up prayers on their behalf very often. And, Lord, I pray they'd be encouraged by that fact. But, Lord, more than their encouragement, God, I pray that you would just give your blessing. Lord, whether they ever know that we're praying, God, I pray that you'd bestow abundant blessings upon that precious family. Lord, who left everything that they knew here in the United States that they might follow your will. Lord, please bless the Sanabria family, bless their children, and God, give them much fruit for their labor there in Columbia. I pray for the Ray family, what a precious couple they are. Lord, what an encouragement they are to me. And Lord, I just pray that this evening you would encourage their hearts and bless them. I pray you'd strengthen them. If there might be some need in their life, Father, I pray that you would meet it this evening. Lord, I know that there are many people in our church that have great need right now. Lord, some are dealing with health issues. Some are dealing with their job situation. God, some are dealing with depression and discouragement right now. Lord, I thought about this morning as I was preaching how there's so many different people that were listening to the message. 
There were some that were uh, rejoicing in that they had their mother here. There were some that were reflecting on how their mother loved them and did all that they that the mother did for them. There's some this, uh, that was here this morning that their hearts were broken as they remembered that their of their mother's passing. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would give grace, Lord, to every one of these situations. Lord, we sure do love you this evening. God, we pray for Brother Absher tonight that you might fill him and use him to preach the word of God. Lord, that we might be better equipped to serve you this week. God, we pray you get glory for yourself in this service. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are honored tonight to have Brother Kevin Absher. Brother Absher is uh, praying about where the Lord would send him. And uh, he is praying about uh, where God would have him be. And so you pray for Brother Absher. You pray for his family. Uh, that the Lord would give him clear direction so there would be no doubt in his heart and mind where God would have him go, and I know he'd appreciate that. Brother Absher's my friend, and I'm thankful that he is preaching for us tonight. Grab your Bibles, listen, and let the Lord speak to you as our dear friend Kevin Absher comes and preaches the Word of God. All right. Well, thank you for that. Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1. I would like to say how grateful I am for the opportunity to preach tonight. Uh, anytime you get a chance to preach, it's always a, an honor and a privilege. And, uh, you know, Brother Black will mention we're praying about where God would send us. But i got to be honest with you, I'm kind of glad that he has me right here, right now. So it's been a blessing to be at this church and, and uh, to get to know some of you folks better. And as we... Uh, as we uh, uh, as we uh, sit out here for a while and, and uh, just contemplate on what God's doing in our life and, and what he has for us. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about your future uh, with the things going on here. And what a blessing it is to see the church come together the way it has as far as the remodel goes. And, and uh, it's been neat to uh, get to know folks and see how God's working in their life here at Bible Baptist. And, of course, we prayed for Tuscaloosa for quite some time and, and uh, wanted the Lord to do something great in this town. And, and we'll continue to do so, knowing that you're here laboring uh, for this uh, great city. And uh, But I'm thankful tonight to, to preach. I've had some unique experiences while being here. Uh, preaching in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a room at a camera was unique for me. I enjoyed that. It was a unique experience. And now I get to preach on a trailer. And uh, I tell you, this is a unique experience as well. What I'm grateful about is there's not a truck attached to it. Can you imagine... Preaching on a trailer with a truck there, if it goes south any kind of way, they just start pulling you away. And uh, But uh, anyway, I'm grateful for the uh, confidence tonight in uh, uh, y'all coming out and, and hearing uh, a message that I would bring to you. And uh, looking forward to uh, preaching this message and hope it will be a blessing to you. Anyway, Judges chapter 1, uh, by now you should have had plenty of time to get there. Judges chapter 1, if you would look with me. Uh, down at verse number 21, Judges chapter 1, verse number 21, uh, the Bible says, And the children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites that inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. Jump down to verse number 27. Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of uh, Bethshean and her towns, nor Tanak and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor in her towns, nor the inhabitants of Ibliam in her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo in her towns. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanite to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell in Gezer among them. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahalal, but the Canaanites dwelt among them and became tributaries. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akcho, nor the inhabitants of Zidon, nor the of Alab, nor of Akzim, nor of Helba, nor of Aphek, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Bethanath. But 
he dwelt among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Bethanath became tributaries unto them. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres, in Ajalon, and in Shelbim. Yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed, so that they became tributaries. And the coast of the Amorites was from the going up to Akrabim, from the rock and upward. So as we see here, a, a phrase that you would have seen over and over and over is how they did not drive out the inhabitants of the land. And I want to take that thought as I was reading through this passage. Obviously, God uh, placed something on my heart uh, as far as a message to bring forth. But thinking about the fact that they did not drive out the inhabitants of the land. And I want to preach to you a message entitled, Driving Lessons. Driving Lessons. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. Lord, we do come to you tonight. We're so grateful for your goodness to us. Thank you that you allow us to, to meet together here in this place. Thank you for these dear, sweet people, this pastor and his family. Please watch over them uh, as they go about your business, as they go about uh, living for you. And I pray for tonight's message that it would be you would be the one that they hear from, that you would use my lips and my, my words today to be a blessing unto them. And I pray that this would be a help. And it just, is the account in the history of Israel of the 12 men and one woman who served as judges from the time of Joshua's death unto the time of Samuel. Although these judges were greatly used by God, none of them were national leaders who appealed to the total nation as Moses and Joshua had done. Starting with Abraham and continuing right on through our present age, God has always been interested in calling out a people for his name's sake. And as we meet tonight, uh, we call ourselves uh, Bible Baptist Church. We are the church uh, that we know that the Lord has brought us together. We are his church. And right now in the day and age we live in, we are his people. And it's uh, it's incumbent upon us to represent him while we're up on this earth. It's incumbent upon us to be uh, the salt and light that he wants us to be. And as we think about his name, uh, we need to think about what we are doing in his name. We need to think about the things that we are uh, to accomplish in his name. And the reality is it's all going to be his power and his strength. He just wants to use us to accomplish it. But I want you to know tonight, and I hope to get across to you tonight, the importance of following God's directions completely. It has said that to be obedient, you need to be, do it completely, immediately, and sweetly. Uh, to be completely obedient. Uh, so when we get the word from the Lord, when we get the instruction from the Lord, we need to do it immediately. Not delay, not put it off, but do it immediately. Uh, do it completely and then have the right attitude. Do it sweetly. <clears throat> and so as I read this passage and think about uh, the time of Israel and what they're going through and, and finally get to that promised land, finally get into the place that God had prepared for them, knowing what all they had to do uh, uh, to possess that land, I can't help but think about how long ago God made that proclamation, that promise. If you think about it, Genesis chapter 12, you don't have to turn there, but you remember that passage there in verses 1 through 3, how uh, it records God calling Abraham. At that time, he was called Abram. But God called him, and he, and he gave him the promises that God had intended for his people. He said, I will make thee a great nation, and thou shalt be a blessing. And you know what? It goes on to say that God would bless those that bless them, and he would curse them that curses that nation. But that nation and that people were to be a blessing to all the other nations that would ever set foot upon the earth. Genesis chapter 12, down in verse number 6, the Bible says, And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, and unto the plain of Moray. And the Canaanite was then in the land, and the Lord appeared unto Abram, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord, who appeared unto him. So we see, as he was traveling out, think about that call. Think about what God had done with Abraham. He told him, to, he told him just to leave his kindred, leave his people, and go to a place that he would show them. And the reality was, he just traveled until God finally said, stop. He just trusted the Lord. He just, he just followed the Lord and followed his instruction until God says, okay, you're there. 
He didn't know what to look for. He didn't know what he was uh, aiming for. He just simply went by the voice of God until God said, you're there. And he tells him right there. So we see in these verses uh, 7 and 8 of chapter, uh, or I'm sorry, 6 and 7 of chapter 12, we see uh, God giving Abraham the vision of the exact land that he wanted them to inhabit. He wanted them to be in that place there. Now, we, the place is affectionately called the promised land. It was promised to them. Not only was it promised to them as a people, but there were promises to them as they dwelt in that land, as they lived for his name's sake. And I think about uh, that proclamation, and, and uh, we, we know that, that call was given to Abraham, and what a tremendous call that was. And, and I often think about that call, and uh, you know, you think about different calls in the Bible, and, and of course even today I was asked about my call uh, to the ministry. And uh, you think about those things, but imagine that. And I'm going to call you out. You're going to leave everybody you know, and you're going to start a new nation. But you're going to be my people. And I'm going to uh, take you to a land that you know not of. And not only that, but the promise given, but you think about how it continued on. Uh, Genesis chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. The Bible says, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee. And to thy seed after thee, and I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, and the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That was not just a promise to Abraham, it was a promise to a seed that hasn't even been born yet. It was a promise made to, uh, to his generations after him that were still yet to come. But God made that promise, and in verse 21, the Bible says, But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. And he made that proclamation, that I will establish my covenant with Isaac. Ishmael, that was the, 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 the fruit of the flesh for Abraham. It was, a, it was not the promised son, but God had rejected Ishmael. The fruit of faith uh, that we have in Isaac, that promised seed, was the, was the seed, the fruit that the, God was going to bless through Abraham. And it was going to be his seed, named specifically. So we see that promise given to Isaac as well. That promise passed on to Isaac, specifically to Isaac. God gave it initially to Abraham, but by name gave it to Isaac as well. And as you continue on, and I'm just going to give a, a little bit of history here to kind of set up the table for where we're at here in Judges. But in chapter 35, uh, verses 10 through 12, the Bible says, And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, and thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it. And to thy seed after thee will I give the land. So we see that there. Uh, it was now given to Jacob. Uh, the promise given to him. And the blessings passing on to him and how God was going to make a great nation and continue the promise that he had given to Abraham many years ago. But it does continue. Uh, Genesis 50 verse 24. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he swore unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now, we know that brief period of time where, where uh, famine was in the land and the, and the children of Israel, uh, uh, the sons of Jacob, traveled to, uh, or through, through God's providential uh, guidance of Joseph, he brought him to Egypt, and he was able to go before all the people to save much people alive. And so we have that time there that they were outside the land. And, uh, but but uh, as uh, Joseph was preparing to die, he recognized the promise. And he later says, hey, carry my bones out of here when you go back. He believed and trusted in the promise of God. He believed in the promise that God had given to, to his people. And he uh, had no reason to ever doubt what God had said and what God was preparing to do. And so as he was preparing to die, he said, hey, when you leave this place, and you will leave this place, make sure you carry my bones with you. I want to be in the land that God had set aside for his people. And I want to be there. Uh, and I want my bones to be there uh, for the rest of my days. So you think about that period, obviously we have that period of uh, over 400 years of slavery and bondage in Egypt. And uh, uh, at that time, obviously, uh, uh, God was not using anybody that we have by name. It was all the way up until the point where we see Moses called by God. 
and Moses was going to be uh, brought forth as the deliverer to deliver the uh, children of Israel out of Egypt. But I want you to see what happened in Numbers chapter 13, in verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. See, even after all those years of slavery, all those years away from uh, out of God's uh, 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 promised land, all those years being bound and being uh, brought to, to uh, 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 as a slave and being made to work and, and uh, a toil under all that pressure, all those years later, God still remembered his promise to his people. God still remembered what he had planned. And you know what? He passes it down to Moses. He says, uh, I want you to go to that place which I give unto the children of Israel. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 24, it said, Every place where on the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. And what a tremendous promise by God. And how it continues it on. See, God doesn't forget his promises. I know many times in our life, uh, we buy into a promise of God. We read about it. We claim it. And then maybe through uh, uh, various circumstances, we may get away from God. We may get outside of God's will. But can I tell you that God still promised what he promised? God still has intended for you what he had intended for you from the beginning that he brought you into existence. God's plan never changed for the children of Israel. And as Moses came on the scene, he renews that promise to Moses for the children of Israel. <clears throat> and of course, now we have 40 years of wilderness wandering, uh, stubbornness, uh, God having to judge them. But I want you to notice something unique in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, as we uh, uh, get familiar with that passage, Joshua appear, or God appears unto Joshua and says, Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. And he says, now you're going to lead the people. And in verse number 3 of chapter 1, he said, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. So just because the leader changed doesn't mean God's promise changed. Just because uh, things didn't go exactly as, as they thought it should, especially spending all that time as a slave in Egypt, and it couldn't have been great. No telling how many generations died, were born in Egypt and died in Egypt. But we know this generation was going to be brought up out of Egypt. It was going to be taken back to that promised land, that promise that God had for them <clears throat> those many years ago. So as we get here to the book of Judges, chapter 1, we uh, no doubt... The history of Joshua, where they conquered the land, they fought those battles, and, and they uh, conquered that, and they were ready to divide up the land by lot. They were ready to give it to the, the, the each tribe of Israel to go and possess the land that God had promised them. And after dividing of the land, and even after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel, for the first time, find themselves without a leader. I mean, think about that. They're without a leader at this point. As we get to the book of Judges, they don't have a leader. The way Moses led them, the way Joshua led them, the way they had uh, the, the, the patriarchs lead them on from Abraham on. And we get to this point here, I want you to notice a key phrase. If you read the book of Judges, you'll notice a key phrase that's mentioned four times. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. No one to, uh, to, to guide them, no one to, to, uh, to, uh, to be a strength for them, to be a so support for them. They had no leadership. This period of time has been characterized by another phrase we find, and it says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So as they were finally getting to the promised land, they fought the battles to drive out or to, to, to conquer the land and to get it to the point where they can go possess it. They realized one thing. They were doing that which was right in their own eyes. Can you imagine how many directions that is? When people start doing that which is right in their own eyes, now there's a lot of different directions there. And it can't be unified. It can't be uh, uh, anything that resembles anything that God's in charge of because everybody's going their own direction. <clears throat> what a tragedy for the people who had experienced God's power and blessings and were the people of God's promises to fall away from such a lofty position. <clears throat> they were now in the land that they were promised. They were now ready to take it over. And uh, they were without a king. They were doing that which was right in their own eyes. So we're told here in Judges chapter 1 that as the children of Israel began taking possession of the promised land, that over and over again they failed to drive out the inhabitants of the land. And those inhabitants would become a snare unto them that I believe is still going on to this very day. 
Those inhabitants are a snare unto the people of God, to God's people, the nation of Israel. <clears throat> you know, you think about that, and as we relate it to our Christian life, our, our walk with the Lord, you know what, if we don't drive some things out of our life, it can become a snare to us as well. If we don't take the promises of God, if we don't take His Word uh, to heart, the forever settled in heaven Word of God, if we don't uh, take it to heart and obey it completely and uh, let it guide our lives, we can find ourselves in a situation to where we're snared by the things that we allow around us. We're snared by the, the devices that dev the devil wants to bring up to bring you down. It's important to realize that the promised land is not a picture of heaven, by the way. A lot of people say, well, the promised land, that's heaven. It was not a picture of heaven. I don't believe it was. I believe it's a picture where God's people would dwell upon the earth and be a testimony unto him. A testimony unto him as his people as they live their days upon the earth. You know what? You and I can take uh, uh, some resemblance for that because we're here upon the earth. We're here as God's people. But I want you to know the promised land is a picture for you and I of the victorious Christian life. Living exactly where God wants us to live. Doing exactly what God wants us to uh, do. Uh, uh, <clears throat> benefiting from his provisions for our life. And being a people uh, with a testimony for his name's sake. That's what I believe the uh, promised land pictures. And you know what? If we're not careful, if we follow the same patterns the children of Israel did, <clears throat> this world will be a snare to us as well. This, this world and the devices the devil uses will be a snare unto us. And as we read this first chapter here, we see over and over again how they failed to drive out the inhabitants of the land. They failed to, to leave. They failed to, to remove them from their presence. And therefore, they became a snare. Later on, they would teach them idolatry, and they would teach them all kinds of pagan rituals and all kinds of pagan worship. And we'll see a vicious cycle throughout the book of Judges where the children of, God, of Israel would, uh, would fall into uh, depravity, would fall into uh, uh, all kinds of pagan ways, and they would be enslaved. They would be uh, 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 brought to as a, as a slave, and, and people would rule over them. And they'd finally get to a point where they'd, they would repent of their sin, and they would, uh, they would cry out to God for help, and they would seek his face, and God would finally send to deliver unto them to bring them out of their uh, current persecution. You know what? Then they would live in peace and harmony for a while then start that cycle all over again it's a cycle throughout the book of judges they live for god forget about god live for the world live for themselves get enslaved and snared cry out to god god will deliver them and it would be over and over again you know that's a defeated life if you ask me anyone that's living the christian life that follows that kind of a pattern but that's such a defeated life to to be on top and, in the, and I'm not saying you can't fall down. I'm not saying you can't uh, have some heartache sometimes. But there's got to be something uh, <clears throat> different for someone who is just constantly going through that cycle of getting snared by sin, getting right with God, experiencing his blessings, going right back into sin and keeping that cycle up. At some point, we got to drive out. we got to drive out the inhabitants of the land, drive out those things. So tonight, I'm going to really quick give you three lessons for driving or three driving lessons to help you maintain or attain the victorious Christian life. Number one, in driving, you got to obey the posted laws. Obey the posted laws. Now, for you and I, we know that to be the Bible. The Bible should be our final authority for all that we do, all that we think, all that we believe. It should be the final authority. All that we do should line up with the Word of God. And as we as we live our days in this life, in this Christian life that God has given us, uh, uh, we need to use the Bible to be a tool to help us along. Uh, through the Holy Spirit's illumination, we are guided by His truth, guided by His words. And that should be what we use. And so, as we drive through this life, we need to obey the posted laws. And I think about some of the laws of God. I think about some of the things that we have here. And they're meant not to be grievous. As the Bible tells us, the commandments are not, of God are not grievous. They're meant to be a blessing to us. They're meant to be a help to us. <clears throat> and I, if you, uh, I'm going to find my place again. The wind has <laughs> altered my, uh, my place. But Judges chapter 1, I want you to look at verse number 17. Verse number 17, the Bible says, And Judah went with Simeon his brother, and they slew the Canaanites, the inhabitants of Zephath, and utterly destroyed it. <clears throat> so what I see here is I see Judah going to help another tribe. Judah going to help Simeon. And I keep thinking about the, the posted laws, the laws of God. And I keep thinking about here, 
uh, in the, the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping, how Judah was uh, ready to be a help to somebody else, ready to go and help fight to help them as they capture their piece of land, as they drive out the inhabitants that were in that place, and they go to help them. And look at verse 19, because of Judah helping Simeon his brother, we now have verse number 19, the Bible says, And the Lord was with Judah. So you see how that works, the law of sowing and reaping? As we do what God wants us to do, then God will then do what he wants to do on our behalf. It's, a, it's a, a law of God, and we understand that. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse number 9, that uh, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is a law of God for God's people. We need to be people who are, uh, who are uh, sowing to the, to the spirit and not to the flesh. But be not deceived. If that's going to be your life, if you're going to sow into the flesh, you're going to reap according to the flesh. So we have the law of sowing and reaping. The fact that a Jew was willing to help out another brother, help out a, uh, another tribe to drive out the inhabitants. So we see that's what God does in our life for us as today as Christians. As we sow, we need to make sure that we're sowing things that we want to reap, right? As we sow good things, God will uh, allow us to reap good things. Now, when we think about that verse, we always think of the negative. It's always, it's always negative. And the reason why we always think of the negative is because that's usually what we're involved with. Is the negative. So always think, oh, we're going to reap what we sow, and it's always a, a a a bad thing in our life. But you know what? There's a good thing. There's a positive to sowing and reaping. As you sow bountifully, then you'll also reap bountifully, and we get that promise from God. I'm glad we have things like that in God's Word to show us how we should operate in this life. Show us the things that we should do that bring about His blessings. You know, as we live this Christian life, uh, and I know for my sake. I always want to be under the spout where the blessings come out. I want to make sure that I'm right there where God says he is willing to bless and he will bless in, in each life. And I want to make sure I do those things. So <clears throat> as you drive, as you go through this life, make sure you obey the posted laws. Take the word of God and allow it to guide your life and teach you. I think about other things like assembling of yourselves. We heard quite a bit about that this morning. Hebrews chapter 10 verse number 25 says, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Well, that's, that's something God has given us in his word. <clears throat> and I think that's something that should be important to us. If we're going to live a victorious Christian life, we need to make sure that we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as his people, as that body of Christ locally here, uh, uh, doing his will, being representing him as his church. <clears throat> You've heard that people say all the time or quite a bit that, well, I can worship God just as much at home as I can at church. Well, I don't think he can. I don't really think you can because you're missing out on obeying the Lord by simply assembling with other folks. And if you're not obeying the Lord, how can you truly worship Him? How can you worship Him with sincerity and honesty if you're not obeying Him? And I think about uh, the, the, the body being fitly joined together. And if you're not showing up, there's another part of the body that's not in, uh, being blessed or edified because you didn't show up. Now I know there's reasons not to not to come, but they should be the rarity in our life. They should be the rare things that keep us out of church. I think about Nehemiah building that wall. They built it in record time. And that's because everybody had a mind to work. Everybody came and stood their post, and they did the work that was necessary. Just think if somebody was missing or somebody said, ah, it's, I can do it later. Man, no telling how that work would have been hindered. But they had a mind to work, and they came and assembled together and did what was necessary. I think about the Great Commission. I think about how we're told to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. I think about how we're told to teach all nations, baptizing them, and then teaching them to observe all things. As we read that Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, I like the way that verse ends, and it says, um, talks about how uh, in that Great Commission, as we go and teach all nations, and we uh, compel them to come in, we baptize them, and then we teach them to observe all things, whatsoever the Lord has commanded us. And the Bible says, And lo, I am with you always. You know, I heard a preacher a while back say, No go, no low. And if you're not willing to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ, then it's going to be hard pressed for the Lord to be with you always. And we need to be people that are telling others about Christ. The Great Commission compels us to. So for one, in this life that we're living, driving through this life, lessons for driving, First of all, obey the posted laws. Obey the word of God. Secondly, can I bring up 
If you look at uh, verse number 28 back in Judges chapter 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. <clears throat> so we think about that passage there. And, and, of course, the Bible says that when they were strong, they put them to tribute. You know what they said? And they said, You can stay here, but you're going to pay us to stay here. Now, you can stay in the land, but you're going to pay us. But that's not what God told them to do, right? God didn't tell them to allow them to stay if they pay you. He said, drive them out. Right. He said, drive them out of the land. And you know what? Th those these, This tribe here, they came up with an alternate plan. And we're never in a good position if we try to come up with an alternate plan uh, from that which we've been given by the Lord. Amen. So lesson number two in <clears throat> driving lessons, can I tell you to avoid alternate routes? Avoid alternate routes. Avoid thinking you have a better way. Avoid thinking that there's always a better way to do something apart from what the Bible says. Avoid thinking it's okay if you uh, uh, skirt things here. It's okay if you uh, take a shortcut there. You know what? You may get there quicker. I understand that. But you know what? You're going to miss out on what God has for you because you didn't go exactly the way God wanted you to go. And I think about that in relationship to driving and finding a shortcut and things like that. You know, and, and many times... We take shortcuts, we miss out on what God had intended for us right around the corner. We miss out on some things that God had intended for us. You might be thinking, oh, it's a shortcut. Oh, it'll get me there quicker. But God had a plan for you. God had a purpose for you. And because you decided to take an alternate route and go a different direction, you're going to be missing out on something that God has for you. And I, as I taught young people uh, in my previous ministry, uh, one of the things they always were concerned about is who they're going to marry who they're going to marry, and, and things like that. And I used to tell them, listen, you just follow God's will for your life. You just do exactly what God wants for you to do. And I promise you, if you're following God's will for your life, you'll run smack dab into the person that God wants you to marry. You can't help but run into them. And I think about that. That's God's will for any aspect of your life. If you just stay where you're supposed to be and do the things that you know are right to do according to God's word, you will receive everything that God has intended for you. But we take alternate routes and we try to do things our own way or we think it's a better way, we miss out on something God has for us. You know, I think about most people just want to, they just want to live a life that's smooth sailing. You know what, if you if it's a, you live a life that's just nothing but smooth sailing, you may be missing out on the waves that God is going to be using to make you a stronger Christian. The, the waves that, of life that God will be using to, to strengthen your faith. Or the waves of life that God is going to be using to to be a benefit and a blessing to somebody else. Hey, so to live a victorious Christian life, don't get caught up in living or going an alternate route. Stay on the path that God has for you. Keep doing the things that God wants for you to do. Don't look for a better way. Aren't we told to trust in the Lord with all our heart? Lean not into our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him, and He will, He shall direct our path. What a blessing that is. That's a promise from God, by the way. You want to look at promises from God as we... Talk about uh, the promised land and things like that. God said he will direct your path if you acknowledge him. The problem is, many times, we go ahead and go our direction and say, God, please bless it. And still saying, God, what will you have me to do? God, what, what do you want from me? Where do you want me to go? <clears throat> the world will tell you just to follow your heart. Right? You probably heard that. Just follow your heart. Just whatever's in your, what do you know in your heart is right to do. Just follow that. Really? <laughs> Didn't Jeremiah 17, 9 come into play there? The Bible tells us our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I remember seeing a cartoon strip a while back, and it was, <clears throat> it was, a, it was a child asking his parents about what he should do, and the, the parent responded back, oh, just follow your heart. So the, the cartoon showed the kid going, heart, what do you want to do? And the heart goes, sin, because that's what our heart wants to do. It's desperately wicked. It wants to sin. So we can't follow our heart. We have to lead our heart. And we lead our heart to the ways that we get from God's word. Amen. And if you want to live a victorious Christian life, hey, don't take an alternate route. Stay right there on the path that God has for you. It's what he intended for you. Job admitted that. He said, but, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You want to take a shortcut? You want to go a different direction? Don't expect to come out as gold. Don't expect to come out that way. So we see here the children of Israel. <clears throat> they didn't drive out the inhabitants of that land. They simply said, ah, oh, we'll, we'll keep them here and we'll put them under tribute. That wasn't God's plan for them. Can I tell you a third thing? 
in driving lessons here. <clears throat> Number three, eliminate blind spots. Eliminate blind spots. And if you look there with me in chapter 1, verse number 34, the Bible says, And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, and they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. What a tragedy that is. You know what blind spots are as you drive? It's, it's the places you can't see too well. As you're driving, it, you know, it's, it's in those places that are hard to see. You know what? But as a Christian living this Christian life, we need to walk around sober and vigilant. We gotta be aware that our, we have an adversary out there, the devil walking about as a roaring lion, seeking who may devour. The devil has all kind of devices that he wants to use to, tr use to trip you up. We're told to walk circumspectly. We're told to be sober and vigilant. We're told to be aware of what's going on around us through the Word of God. And if we're not, if we don't do what we can to eliminate blind spots in our life, we can find ourselves in impending trouble. We can find ourselves in trouble quite a bit. Uh, I don't know how many times I've seen somebody move over on the road and not see a car there, and it turned into a road rage situation. You know, just a little little bitty thing they could have avoided by, by, by eliminating a blind spot. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in Dallas and lived around Dallas. I've seen plenty of road rage. <clears throat> I've been the, uh, the object of road rage. And I remember one time looking at a, uh, <clears throat> driving out at 635, which is the main loop there in Dallas. And I remember a car driving on the road didn't pay attention to its blind spot, didn't realize there was a car there, and began moving over, and at that time realized there was somebody there and swerved back. Well, that car, reacting to him coming in his lane, he swerved over, which created a trigger effect to the final car that swerved much harder, and that car ended up <clears throat> going all the way across the highway and then veering back across and flipping over. Now, let's think about all the danger that can happen, not just to your life, but those around you, when you avoid or when you uh, fail to eliminate blind spots in your life. You fail to, to remove those things that can bring about sin. You fail to remove those things in your life that can be a snare unto you. And as I look at this tribe here, Dan, you know what? They didn't drive out the children. Matter of fact, <clears throat> they didn't drive out the inhabitants of the land. Those inhabitants said, no, 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 Dan, you get up into the mountain and you don't come down. I mean, they forced them to do what they wanted to do. Dan should have gone in with all kinds of power and all kinds of authority because they're God's people, and they should have drove them out. They should have cleared them out of the land, but they didn't. And it wasn't just, okay, y'all can stay here if you pay us. No, that turned the tables on them and said, no, you will, you will stay up there and not come down. We'll tell you what to do. And if we're not careful in our life as we live in this world uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're not careful, <clears throat> the world will end up telling us what to do. We're not careful. If we're not vigilant. If we're not sober enough to stay faithful to the things that God has for us, uh, claim His promises, and stay true and faithful to His word, <clears throat> the world just may dictate to us what we should be doing. And as the church of God is, when we get, when we have that promise from Jesus Christ that the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, we need to take it to heart, not put ourselves in a situation to where the world is telling us what to do. <clears throat> you don't think it can? What's been going on for the last two months? <clears throat> churches all over being told they can't meet. You got governors telling churches, hey, you can't meet for a year till after this, this virus has gone away. What a tragedy that is. Hey, if we're not careful, if we, don't, if we don't eliminate the blind spots in our life, we don't eliminate those troublesome spots in our life, then we'll get ourselves in a situation that the world is telling us what to do. Right? And hey, we're here to make a difference in the world. We're not here for the world to make a difference in us. <clears throat> We're here to be his people. <clears throat> to, have unobstruct, uh, to have an unobstructed view in life, we got to walk by faith. <clears throat> the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 14, verse 23, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And be people of faith. Trust the promises that God has given you. Trust his word. Take them to heart. Allow them to permeate your mind and your heart. Live, live uh, faithfully uh, those, those precepts that we read. read uh, live faithfully those things day in and day out. And you'll live the victorious Christian life. As, as I close tonight, I, I think of Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, and Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. They pretty much say word for word the same thing. But it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know, we can't trust ourselves to our imaginations and our thoughts. But we can trust a faithful God. 
We can trust a righteous, holy God and His forever settled in heaven word to guide us and teach us what we should do, to guide us and help us through this life. And as we practice these things and apply these things to our life, we will live a victorious Christian life, unlike what the children of Israel experienced when they were in the promised land. It's true for any people that forsake the instructions of God. It is still true that righteousness exalted the nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Again, righteousness exalted the nation. Well, who do you expect to bring forth righteousness? Shouldn't it be God's people? Shouldn't it be God's people living according to God's word? I'm going to read to you a quote from uh, General Douglas MacArthur. A famous general, victorious general in our nation's history. But he said this, In this day of gathering storms, a moral deterioration of political power spreads its growing infection. It is essential that every spiritual force be mobilized to defend and preserve the righteous base upon which this nation is founded. For it has been that base which has been the motivating impulse to our moral and national growth. History fails to record a single precedent in which nations subject, subject to moral decay have not passed into political and economic decline. There has been either a spiritual reawakening to overcome the moral lapse or a progressive deterioration leading to ultimate national disaster. And I think about our great nation and how it was founded. And I think about the influence that's going on today and realize where are the people of God? Where are the people of God? It is us that should be influencing them. Righteousness exalted the nation. And I think about it's the church house that should be influencing <clears throat> everything around us. The people that are called according to his name. Just like the people of Israel were supposed to be a testimony to the Lord, living in the promised land, living according to his blessings, you and I as a church today should be living according to God's blessings and God's power. And we should be influencing the world around us. And that's living a victorious Christian life. Again, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. God is watching his people. And God will bless according to what his people are doing. Are you living a victorious Christian life tonight? I hope so. I know it's a silly title, driving lessons. But you know what? We need to be people that are driving things out of our life. Make sure we're obeying the posted laws. Make sure we're avoiding going alternate routes. And make sure that we eliminate blind spots <clears throat> to live a victorious Christian life. And I hope that's what you're living today. Father, we love you. We thank you again for your direction in our life. Thank you for the perfect word of God that we have. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that... Uh, guides us in all truth and I pray that we would take the word of God to heart we'd let it saturate our mind and our and our uh, our thinking and all that we do and we'll let it uh, to empower us and strengthen us as we step off into this uh, world around us as we uh, uh, become salt and light uh, for the societies around us I pray that we'd make a difference uh, that we'd be a people that you're calling out uh, according to your great name and that we would serve you and honor you and draw other men unto you Lord, help us to be people that exalt Jesus Christ, for it's when Christ is lifted up that all men will be drawn unto him. Lord, bless your people tonight, and Lord, we give you praise and glory for all that you do and all that you're going to do. And it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Let's bow our head and hearts together tonight. The Lord spoke into your heart. I would encourage you to speak back to him. I don't know what he might have said to you tonight. But whatever he said to you this evening, I would have, I'm sure he would appreciate you speaking back to him. Driving lessons. Great message tonight. Simple, practical, great message tonight. Brother David's going to play. As he plays, we'll give you an opportunity to speak back to the Lord this evening.
one more verse. Jesus paid it all. This evening, and I know Brother Absher probably can't see you, but uh, make sure you somehow let him know uh, that we appreciate him preaching uh, tonight. What a great message. Now, down here at our driveways, we're going to have our two men there, and uh, they'll be receiving the offering. If you have anything you'd like to drop in tonight, maybe you didn't have an opportunity to give this morning, and uh, if you want to do that, you can do that at this time. All right, how many you know what's going on with the baby bottles? Everybody know what's going on with that? Do we need any clarification about uh, those baby bottles tonight? Well, Miss Denise Cork has uh, uh, got uh, us in touch with this group that is uh, trying to help uh, concerning abortions. And uh, it's called Save a Life, and uh, it's called Baby Bottle Boomerang. What we're asking you to do is just take those baby bottles home, drop in some change, and uh, bring them back if you've done that. Uh, but if you have change you'd like to give, I'm sure she'd be willing to take that as well. And then um, I believe at the end of this month is when we want all that back. And uh, so please, if you took a baby bottle and put your change in, uh, bring it back at the end of the month. Remember, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, our midweek prayer meeting inside. And I'm looking forward to that. May God bless you this week. You are dismissed.